I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16. I want to talk this morning about God moving out. Uh, We talk a lot about the process of going into the tabernacle to minister to God, but I want to talk about this morning about God's outgoings. In fact, that's what I want to call it this morning. I want to call it the outgoings of God. Uh, Let's go to verse 21, uh, Exodus 40 and verse 21. It says, and he brought the ark. If you don't know where Exodus is, go to Genesis and turn right. Go to the last chapter in the book, and you'll get there. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the veil of the covering and covered the ark of the testimony as the Lord commanded Moses. And he put the table in the tent of the congregation upon the side of the tabernacle northward without the veil. And he set the bread in order upon it before the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he put the candlestick in the tent of the congregation over against the table on the side of the tabernacle southward. And he lighted the lamps before the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. (coughs) Sounds like the Lord gave Moses a lot of commands that he's carrying out here. And he put the golden altar in the tent of the congregation before the veil. And he burnt sweet incense thereon, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he set up the hanging at the door of the tabernacle, and he put the altar of burnt offering by the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation, and offered upon it the burnt offering and meat offering or meal offering, as the Lord commanded Moses. Get this page turned here, and I'll read the rest of it. And he set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar and put water there to wash withal. And Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet thereat when they went into the tent of the congregation. And when they came near unto the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. And he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hang the court gate. So Moses finished the work. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. It says, In what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Uh, Chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God said, I'll I'll dwell in them and I'll walk in them. I know God wants to walk in us. God wants to reveal himself through us to the world. And uh, we'll talk about that more later, too, next next time. Paul quotes that scripture, and he relates it to temples, but we also know when you go in the Old Testament that he's relating it to the tabernacle. I want to just take the things of the tabernacle and kind of relate them, types and shadows, to what God wants working in us in his outgoings to the world. First thing they did was they set up the ark, of the covenant in the most holy place because that's where God came to dwell. God came to dwell in our spirit, in our holy of holies, and then He wants to manifest Himself out through us. That's why the Bible says in uh, Romans chapter 12 to present your bodies as a living sacrifice unto God, holy and acceptable unto God. And He says that's your reasonable service. Then you can prove What's the will of God? How do you prove the will of God in your life? You present your body a living sacrifice to God. You can't know the will of God 
until you present yourself to God as a living sacrifice. Then God begins to unveil His will to you. Why would God unveil His will to somebody that's not submitted to it? Anyway, uh, concerning the most holy place, God said this, There I will meet with you and will commune with you. Where did God commune with His people? God communed with His people on the mercy seat that covered the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. Where does God meet with us? Well, He meets in here, in our spirit. We're supposed to worship Him, the Bible says, in spirit and in truth. That's how we come to know Him. That's how we come to uh, commune with Him. But then He also says, I want to walk in you. I don't want to just dwell in you, but I want to walk in you. I want you to be my sons and daughters. I want you to become a walking temple of God so that God can live in us and manifest Himself to the world. Amen? So we go in to lay hold on eternal life. But then we go out so that God can walk among men. God can reveal Himself in us. We are the dwelling place of God. I think that's pretty powerful. To me, that's a pretty powerful thing that that God wants us to enable God to be made known to His universe. That God dwells in us as tabernacle. I mean, how many, how many have heard this old saying, you may be the only Bible that some people ever read. You ever heard that old saying? Yeah. Hopefully when they do, they're not reading fiction. I think sometimes if somebody's reading God in my life, they're probably reading fiction. But what what God will read is the autobiography of God. God wants His own revelation of Himself in us being revealed. Who He is. Not what we are, but who He is. Amen? God's not after spectators. There's a lot of people that are spectators of the activity of God. And I think we've become that. We've become more spectators than we are participators. But He wants us to participate. with. When Jesus appeared to His disciples, how I many when Jesus appeared to His disciples after His resurrection, when He came and appeared to them, He didn't say, okay boys, just stand back and watch me work. That's not what He said. You know what He said? He said, you go into all the world and preach the gospel, and I'll go with you. And they believed him. And they turned the world upside down. Or some people say right side up, because it's upside down to begin with. But our generation, I mean, the generation that's in the church today needs to take that challenge to heart of discipling the nations. We've lost that truth in the church. We've lost it. That God wants us to go out, taking Him out into the world to disciple the nations into the will of God. Amen. God always reveals Himself. If you've ever heard Kelly Varner, he says God always reveals Himself in three dimensions. We are spirit, soul, and body. The tabernacle was an outer court, a holy place, a most holy place. There's lots of threes in the Bible all the way through. There's the third day. There were three feasts. God's a triunity. He's three in one. He's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen? We know that. And there's a lot more. My point is, if you look at the tabernacle, what you see all the way through are the threefold outgoings of God to where God manifests Himself into the world. There's a pattern. And that pattern repeats itself all the way through the tabernacle. So I'm going to start with the Ark of the Covenant and what was contained in it. And what I want to talk about today is how it relates to the outgoings of the Lord manifesting Himself to the world. 
Uh, later I'm going to talk about those things, how it relates to the church. And then someday, down in the future, I want to talk about how the ark relates to the Reformation that's going on in the earth right now today. Because there's truths there. Deeper and deeper truths as you go. Does that make sense? Uh, As God brings His kingdom into the earth. There are three things that's found in the ark. There were three things that were put into the ark of the covenant. You'll find that in the Bible. And I believe they relate to what Jesus Himself accomplished in the will of God. Let me know what was in the ark. Do you remember? The first thing was the tables of the law where God wrote the law on tables of stone. And they, they talked to us about the truth of the Incarnation. I mean, the, <clears throat> they represent the mind of Christ. You know what God said? God said, I'm going to take the law, and instead of writing it in tables of stone, I'm going to write the law in the fleshly tables of the heart. He said, I'm going to write my law in your heart and in your mind. So really what the tables of the law represent is the mind of Christ that God wants to write into us, into our nature, okay? His nature. To where we're ruled in the mind of the Lord Jesus. The first time God gave the law, let me know what happened. The first time that God gave the law, God wrote that law by His own finger. And he wrote it in tables that he himself provided. All he told Moses was, you come up on the mount, I'm going to give you the law. And you take it down. Well, while Moses was up in the mount receiving the law from God, the children of Israel were down at the bottom of the mount with Aaron, who was the high priest. And Aaron had helped them make a golden calf. And they got them some musicians together. They stripped themselves naked. And they were having a party worshiping this golden calf. That sounded like a pretty wild party. It sounded like some of those Hollywood parties, you know what I mean? <clears throat> but there they were at the bottom of the mountain. And Moses, and Moses had went up and Joshua had went part of the way up there. And he was waiting for Moses to come down. And when they came down, they heard all this commotion going on. And Joshua said, man, it sounds like the people are at war down there. And Moses had already heard from God. God had already told him what was going on. They're worshiping an idol down there. And he said, no, it's not the sound of war. But they're committing sin in the camp. And when he went down and he saw them worshiping that golden calf, he got so mad, he threw down the tables of the law. And he broke them. So later God tells him, well, come back. Come back up. And I'm going to give you the law again. How many know man cannot take the law into his own fleshly hands and keep it? So the second time, God told Moses, he said, you... Hew out two tables of stone, and you bring them up there with you, and I'm going to write the law again. But this time, bring a wooden box, an ark, to put that law in. To keep. So he made this ark of wood, and he brought it up, and God wrote the law again and put it in that wooden box. And in Deuteronomy chapter 10, he says, he was rehearsing what God had did, and he said, it's still there today, preserved in that wooden box that he had made. Well, wood represents humanity. The only person that ever lived that walked it out The law was preserved in him. He kept it perfect. Every aspect of the law, he walked it out. You know what he says in Psalm Psalm 40, I think it is, verse 8? He says, I delight to do thy will. 
<clears throat> Psalm 1, verse 2. I think you know this. Anyway, I'll just read it. Don't, you don't have to turn over there. I'll read it. And I promise I'll read it right. Psalm 1, verse 2, he says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate. So the tables of the law represent the incarnation of the Word of God. Are you with me? It was the Word of God incarnated in a man named Jesus who walked it out perfectly. The Word, the Bible says the Word was made flesh and tabernacle among us. And God wrote the laws of His own divine nature in the heart and mind of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And the book of Hebrews says He's going to do the same thing to us. He's going to write His law in our hearts and in our minds. How many of you know that takes place by the working of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives? How does He write His law in our hearts and minds? By His Spirit. Because he's writing it in the fleshly tables of our heart. Amen. The law brings conviction of sin. But how many know the blood of Jesus brought us forgiveness? Brought us reconciliation? Brought us a cleansed? Cleansing our heart from dead works. The law is called the testimony. Jesus gave testimony of who God was. When Jesus walked in the earth, because the law was written in his heart, he gave testimony of who God was. Everywhere he went, he was revealing who the Father was. So the law talks about the incarnation. God wants to incarnate himself. He wants to be made flesh. He wants a dwelling place. He wants a place he can live in and walk in. He wants people that become his sons and daughters that reveal who he is to the world. Amen. Second thing in the ark was Aaron's rod that budded. You remember? Korah, Dathan, Byram, all these men were rebelling. They said, well, you know, who who says God chose Aaron? Blah, blah, blah. You know, all of God's people are holy. No, all of God's people are not holy. All of God's people have not separated themselves and consecrated themselves to God to serve His priest. God chose God chose the Levites. It was His choice. And there are some things that are God's choice. Well, it's the truth. They took that stick, a dead stick, an almond rod, a piece of dead wood, and they took it along with a stick from every other tribe that was a dead stick. And they took those sticks and put them in the most holy place and laid them before the ark. And the next morning when they went in there, the rod that was for Aaron had budded, it had blossomed, and it had bore almonds in one night. Hallelujah! What does that talk about? Resurrection life. You want to bear fruit? Lay yourself up before the ark of God. The only way you can move from a dead state in Adam to a living rod before God is in Christ. It's by resurrection life. Amen? The resurrection life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me know, God causes us day by day through all these things we go through in our lives. You know what we do? We are proving out the reality 
of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That Christ himself lives in us. That he's living in us by his resurrection life. How does he prove that out? He takes you down into a state where you're dead. You're dead. You can't bear any fruit of your own. You can't do anything. You're helpless. You're a dead stick. You ever been a dead stick? Yeah. Every time it seems like there's some aspect of death that overcomes us. You ever been there where you feel like you're overcome by death? We receive an impartation of the life of Christ. You know what? It raises us up and it makes us victorious. Amen. Okay. We'll go deeper in these things later. The third thing was the golden pot of manna that was placed inside the ark, preserved. That speaks to us of the Lord Jesus' ascended life. He feeds us with the bread of heaven. That's what the manna was. The manna, Jesus said, it was the bread from heaven. It was the bread of heaven. It was angels' food. That's a, that's pretty good food, I think. <laughs> but we begin to feed upon the words of life. Are you with me? It's a daily provision that He makes available to us. You know, every day He has a living word that we can live by. That's food to us. Amen. And all those things, tables of the law, almond rod that budded, Aaron's rod, golden pot of manna, every one of those things came by the miraculous divine intervention. Every one of them. Now, I tell you what, we do ourselves a great disservice if we forget that God is the God of miracles. God is the God of miracles. In fact, if we lose that expectation of God's divine intervention in our lives, we lose what's in the ark. With God, nothing shall be impossible. That's Luke chapter 1. With God, nothing. That was Mary's response to God. All these things came during times of trial. Every one of those things that was in the ark came during a time of trial. In fact, the law was given while Israel was down at the bottom of the mountain worshiping a golden calf. Manna was given when they were wandering in the wilderness complaining against God that God brought them out there to kill them because they didn't have anything to eat. And the rod of Aaron came to life during the time that Israel was complaining against Moses and Aaron and his sons being chosen for the priesthood. And you know what happened to those that rebelled? The earth opened up and swallowed them alive. My, here's my point. None of those things were deserved. But they didn't deserve any of them. They didn't deserve the law of God. They sure didn't deserve God's priesthood, and they didn't deserve the manna. But God gave it to them anyway. Why? It was just the mercy of God that intervened to bring them provision and to settle disputes. That makes sense. 
We've got to be careful. We have to be very careful not to lose sight of God's own sovereign workings. Amen. God works sovereignly to fulfill. If you won't do it, He'll bypass you and He'll go to somebody else. But His will is going to Amen. Okay, let's look at another group of three. The ark. The ark itself, the mercy seat, and then the cherubim on top of it. Ark, mercy seat, and the cherubim. The cherubim were wrought on top of the mercy seat. Looking at Those three things form the throne of God. That's God's throne. The ark, mercy seat above it, and the cherubim. God said, I will come in the, between the midst of the cherubim, and there I'll meet with you. I'll meet with you there. The ark represents the... Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou, and the ark of thy strength. Psalm 132. verse. God always moves. His rest is the result of His throne ruling over all. You know why God's at rest? He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's immutable. He don't make mistakes. He works everything by the counsel of His own will. He does it by His own power. He's sovereign king. He rules over everything. He's at rest. You know what his invitation is? Come, enter into my rest. The works have been finished. Amen. Anytime we move out to do anything for God, You've got to move in an attitude of rest. Amen. God's at rest in you. He's not fretting. He's not worrying. He's not upset. Nothing's taking him by surprise. He's at perfect rest. And if he sets his throne in us, we'll be at rest. You know what? I've got unrest in my life. You know what that means? His throne's not fully set in. Amen. All I'm saying is we have to make room for God's throne in our lives. We have to yield to it. Come, take my yoke upon me. Learn of me. I'm meek and lowly. You'll find rest for yourself. That was Jesus' image. The ark was made to contain the law of God. It represents the revelation of God to man. The ark is called the ark of the testimony. Because it bears witness. It has the law within it, which is... We are supposed to bear witness... To God. Amen. The ark of His testimony is in me. I'm supposed to be bearing testimony of Him, who He is. Amen. There's witness of God. So do we. It's called the holy ark. So are we. It's called the Ark of Covenant. Why? Because it represents God's faithfulness to man, that God is true to His own nature. 
It's called the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth. <laughs> I like that. Why? Because when we go forth to bear witness of the kingdom of God, we've got to believe that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those that dwell in it. Amen. It all belongs to Him. The ark is Jesus. The mercy seat is Jesus. The cherubim over the mercy seat, it's Jesus. Second thing was the mercy seat. The word they translate mercy seat, when they translate it over into Greek, it's called the propitiation. The word propitiation means to turn away. To turn away God's anger. Some people don't like that, so they use the word expiation. What that means is the turning away of sin. Because people today have a problem with God's wrath. They don't believe God gets angry. I'll tell you what, the Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. Every day when God gets up and He looks at the wicked, He's angry. He is angry with the wicked. Every day. Why? Because they violate love. That's why. Amen. If we don't believe God's angry with sin, we don't understand the cross. In fact, God has a very violent reaction to sin. You can find it all the way through the Bible. He has a very violent reaction to sin. Anytime he sees sin, he violently reacts to it. If you don't believe that, ask Sodom and Gomorrah. That was a very violent reaction to sin. <laughs> Read the book of Revelation. You know what happens in the midst of the throne? There is a slain lamb. In the, right in the midst of the heart of God's throne, there is a blood stain. That's where anger's met. That's that is where Christ's sacrifice works its propitiation work in the heart of God. It met God's anger. Amen. The ark speaks of His light, His mercy seat of His love, and the cherubim speak of His light. And above all of it, above all that, God puts His glory. Cherubim speak of life. In fact, the Bible says they were the guardians of the way of life. They kept the way of life. They represent God's everlasting life. They don't rest day or night. You know what they're crying? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The earth is full of His glory. They speak to us of the Son of God. The Bible says, He that hath the Son hath life. If you don't have the Son, if you move out in God's light and God's love and God's life, you will find yourself becoming an effective witness. In fact, cherubims were what represented the flesh of Jesus. You remember the veil that was before the most holy place? It had cherubim wrought into it. They were sewn into the veil. They were a part of it. Well, the veil, the Bible says, represents the flesh of Jesus. 
And when the veil was rent, the way into the most holy place was opened up. The thing that prevented men from coming back into the place where he could enter into eternal life was Jesus had not yet come, offered himself as a sacrifice, and had his flesh rent. But the minute Jesus came and his flesh was rent at the cross, the way was opened up so that man could come back to the tree of life and live forever. Amen. Hope it makes some sense. Then you go to the holy place. In the holy place, we know what we find. You find what? The lampstand, the table of the showbread, and you find the altar of incense. The common factor in all three of those things is fire. It takes fire to operate any one of those. There was always fire burning at the altar of incense. In fact, God said, the fire on the altar of incense shall never go out. Even when they carried that altar in their journeys, there was fire burning on it. There was always fire in the altar of incense. Always. And there was fire to keep the lamps burning. When they set up the tabernacle and they put the lamps in there, it took fire to get those lamps back on fire and shining. And there was fire for the bread. Why? Because the bread had to be baked. It took fire to make bread. When you move out of the most holy place, out of the realm of communion to take got into the world. The fire of God has to burn in us. The fire of God needs to burn in us. We got to have experiences where we gain fire from God. I'm making sense to you. We have to have experiences with God where we get the fire we need from God. You got to burn. You got to burn with passion for God. You don't burn with passion for God, you'll never be a testimony to it. There has to be something in you burning for Him if the world's going to see it. greatest deficit in the church today is the lack of fire. Amen. We are not burning. I remember this one brother, he said he was tired of the prayer meetings that he went to where he said everybody around in the prayer meeting were talking about their lack of love for God. Oh, I just don't love God enough. I just don't have the love for Him that I ought to have. Okay. Of course we don't love Him enough. Oh, you don't love Him enough and I don't love Him enough. But what... What do you think your wife would say or your husband would say if every day you told them, oh, I just don't love you enough? Come on. I bet I know what my wife would say. Well, Buster, you better start. Come on, I'm going to tell you the truth. You're the one that has to make the fire burn. We're the ones that have to let the fire burn. You stir it up. Oh, God, give me fire when I need it. Well, you need it. Come on, we need it. We need to get it. Well, I don't know how to get it. Make a sacrifice. That's how you get fire. If you make a sacrifice, 
God will supply the fire. The fire on the brazen altar in the outer court came supernaturally, sovereignly. When they set up the altar of burnt offering in the outer court, God caused fire to come out of the most holy place and hit that thing and caused fire to burn. Why? Because there were sacrifices being offered. You make a sacrifice, God will supply the fire. Come on. Is that right? I'll tell you something, the high priest never went into the tabernacle to minister to God. Because when he went into the holy place, he had to start the incense burning, and he had to bake bread. Come on. And when he went behind the veil, he had to take a censer filled with coals from off the altar of burnt offering. He had to take the fire from that altar that was in the outer court. That's where he got his fire from. He got it from the altar of sacrifice. You want to go into communion with God? You want to burn some incense before God? You want to pray? You want to praise? You want to worship? You better get some fire. Because you can't burn incense without fire. No incense, no cloud on the mercy seat. And if there's no cloud on the mercy seat, there's one dead priest. Because God said, if there's not a cloud of smoke from incense between the cherubims on the mercy seat when I come to meet with you, you're dead. You'll die. Amen. I didn't say it. God said it. Why? Because God wants us to burn. Not burn out. Burn on. Amen. I mean, we're supposed to burn with love and passion. I mean, know that. With intensity. We're supposed to have some type of intensity of desire on the inside of us. We need to fire God. You know what? If one of us is burning, if just one's burning, it'll inspire other people to burn. If one lamp is burning, it'll give light to the others. Are you with me? If one person has baked bread, it'll feed others. If one's burning incense, the fragrance from that, will put an aroma of that incense. If we want to impact other people's lives, fire is not an alternative. It's vital. It's necessary. We have to have it. Amen. Are you all with me? And I'll leave that alone. Then there's the outer court. In the outer court, everything's exposed to the element. The wind, the rain, the storms. Everything that comes, everything in the outer court's exposed. But there's three things out there that speak to us about the protection of God. Let me know God gives us protection. When we, when we move out to the world, we have protection over us. The tabernacle was covered. Four of them, in fact. And the last one was either badger skins or porpoise hide. We don't know which. Because the Hebrew word is not a very translatable word. It can mean badger skin. It can mean porpoise hide. Maybe they got porpoises when they crossed. 
or dolphin hide. I don't know. But it's tough. It can withstand the elements. Amen. Does that make sense? There's the coverings of the tabernacle. Then there's the labor. And then there's the altar in the outer court. Those are the three things that are out there. The coverings preserve the treasure within the tabernacle. The covering was over the dwelling place of God. Why? To preserve. God is able to, God's able to keep us. When we take our spiritual values out to the world, we need the covering of God's Spirit over us so that it can protect so that they can be preserved and kept. They prevented the precious things from being wrongly exposed. Let me know, you don't expose your precious things to everybody. There are some things that the world has no right to see. Why? They're between us and They are precious pearls. You know what he said? You know what Jesus said? Do not cast your pearls. Do not expose your precious things to the unclean. If you do, they will devour. They'll trample them underfoot. Our pearls are not for the world's curiosity or judgment. They're precious to us. They're hidden. Amen. We can't just move in our own direction, in our own way, and expose those things to anybody and everybody. Amen. Why? Because he wouldn't appreciate their value. There are some things we need to reverence. There are some things we need to keep hidden. And there are some things we need to expose. Are you with me? It's important. If we lessen the value of our treasures by exposure, you'll find yourself losing them. They won't be as precious to you anymore. I'm saying we have no place for rash or impetuous displays. Am I making sense to you? You understand what I'm saying? We can't make public what God has determined should remain sacred to us. They need to be kept hidden. Uh, let me just read this scripture. It's a very interesting scripture. I'll just read it. John chapter 2 and verse 23. I'll just read it real quick. But it says, uh, John 2, 23, it says, Now when he was in Jerusalem, talking about Jesus at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. I mean, God gives us wisdom who to commit ourselves to and who not to commit ourselves to. Why? Because some are a waste of your time. And you'll waste your time instead of redeeming your time by ministering to people that will receive you. That's why you have to be led of the Spirit. Everything. We need Christ to cover us as we move out into the world. That's all I'm saying, okay? Why? It protects what's precious from forces that would want to come in and spoil. Amen. 
And it preserves what is precious to those that contain those things. It preserves what's precious within, and it protects it from what's without. That makes sense. A covering protects from what's evil, and it preserves what's good. But you know what? You can't just keep everything covered. Hello? Why? Because you have to venture out in order to be effective to the world. We got to learn that God is able to keep us from the evil one. For a long time we had this fear, fear in the body of Christ, that I can't go out in the world because the world will corrupt me. Well, if the world's corrupting you, you don't need to go out. But the world's not supposed to corrupt us. We're supposed to influence them. Amen? He that is in you is great. If you're still being influenced by wrong people, grow in God, get a little stronger. Ask God to give you more strength. Are you with me? All right. The labor. One thing about the labor, the labor wasn't really affected by storms. Because it was filled with water anyway. Amen. But it was for cleansing. How many know you need cleansing for your journey when you go out into the world? And you don't go out alone because God said, I will walk with you. I'll be in you. I'm going to go with you into the world. I'll walk in you. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. Amen? So what do you do? you got to go to the labor for cleansing. Amen. I mean, no, you don't just need the labor for communion of going into God, but you also need the labor as you go out to the world. You have to be washed. You have to be clean. Amen. Why? You've got to give witness to the world of a clean life. All right. Then the altar. The protection from the blood. Protection from the blood. I mean, that's the beginning of your entrance into God. And you need the power of the blood working in your own life when you go out and face evil supernatural. Your heart has to be clean. If your heart isn't clean, if it's defiled, the enemy will find a doorway into you. Amen. Are you here with me? If the blood's not on every door of your life, the enemy will find entrance. Amen. Then I want to talk about the linen fence, the pillars, and then I want to talk about the curtain, and I'll be through. All around the tabernacle, and I've talked about this before, there was a white linen fence. Linen represents the righteousness of God. The first thing anybody saw was those that were outside were attracted. But it wasn't by the altar, and it wasn't by the laver, and it wasn't by everything inside the tabernacle. It was by the white linen fence that was all around it. What does that mean? Totally righteous in all your dealings with Amen. It was the linen that drew them. And as they searched around that linen fence long enough, they found the gate. Amen. If somebody searches around your life long enough, they ought to find Jesus. There ought to be an opening somewhere for you to tell them about the Lord Jesus. The righteousness of the saints. 
Jesus said, when men see your good works, they will glorify your Father which is in heaven. Because they know God's reaching out to them. How many know people come to know Him by seeing God's love in our lives? God's at work in us. And if He's at work in us, it should make people curious about God. The linen was supported by poles, and they had silver caps. And that's all you could see of them was a little silver cap on. And they were set in sockets of bronze, and every one of them was in its place. If one pole was out of place, guess what? It would ruin the use of it all. In fact, it even pull other poles down. You ever set up a tent and you didn't set it up right? <laughs> you don't get them poles just right, guess what happens to the rest of them? They'll fall. But there was very little of the poles that were seen. Why? Because nobody is supposed to be attracted by the poles. Are you with me? They were supposed to be attracted by the white linen fence. The righteousness of God, not your righteousness. God don't want you on display. He wants to put Himself on display in you and in me. Right, I'm on, sir. They bore witness that there was this inner realm of the tabernacle. And all men needed to do was to make their way around to the end. The pillars remind us of how much we need one another. Come on, we need one another. We are very insufficient by ourselves to bear witness of Him. Amen. You can't do it apart from the rest. We need spiritual order. We need one another. We need to stand. Hallelujah. Why? Because you get in trouble, I need to be there for you. Amen. If I get in trouble, you're there for me. You can line me back up. To make sure the white linen's hanging just right on me. What am making sense to you? And then the last thing you get is the cherubim. You know what it says? Christ Himself. Let me tell you about what Jesus did for me. Let me tell you about what Jesus means to me. You think I'm different? God wants to walk in us out to the world so that we can tell men, here's the way in. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. If you're going to come to the Father and have eternal life, He's the one that made the difference in my life. I'm going to tell you what, Jesus is the one that made a difference. Come on, Jesus is the one that made a difference. I was the most rebellious, angry, obnoxious. You think I'm bad now. No, no, no. I was the most rebellious, angry, obnoxious human being that ever walked. I didn't just get mad. I had rages. And when I had rages, I tore everything up. I threatened to throw my principal down the stairs. And he threatened to throw me down. <laughs> what I'm telling you is, I was a mess. 
I went to a Baptist church that's holding revival. I went so I could see my wife. We weren't married. We were going together. She was very young and I was very young. We got married when she was 16 and I was 18, so go figure. We were very young. 1967, I was 17 years old, she was 15. I went to that revival for one reason and one reason only. I wanted to see my honey. And her mother and dad were very strict. I went so I could be with her. And I went three days. Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, having a week-long revival. Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, it was getting too hot. So I didn't go Wednesday. Because I knew he was talking about me. I went back Thursday. And when he gave the invitation, I knew God was talking to me. This is your time. You need to come. I believe with all my heart, because I did, I did not go the way I was going. Did I still have problems? Oh, yeah. Those problems were not cured overnight. But something changed inside me. Something changed in my heart. And if it hadn't, I don't know where I'd be. Probably either in prison or dead. But my life changed because I had a real living experience with Jesus. Amen. I found the way in. You know how I found it? Jesus said, this is the way. Here, come in right here. This is the way. You want eternal life? Come on in. You want to have a life worth living? I'm it. It's your time. It's your choice. You can go your way or my way. And I said, I'd rather go your way. My way ain't working out too good. You know, I'm thankful. I tell you, I am thankful with all my heart I came to know Him. Because He's made all the difference. Amen. He's, he's the one. Come on, let's be honest. He's the one that's made all the difference in every one of our lives. He's the one that made the difference. And we ought to have some responsibility to take that message out to other people. To tell them Jesus made a difference in my life. He can make a difference in yours. You don't, you don't have to live the way you're living. There's a better way to live. Amen. I'm through. Father, guide us and direct us by Your Spirit. That, that's our greatest desire today, that You would guide and direct us by Your Spirit. Father, we fail so often and sometimes so much to really give place to the Lord Jesus in our lives. Father, we ask You to forgive us. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, use us to make a difference in other people's lives. Lord, we don't want to be religious. We want to be real. We want to manifest who Jesus is. We ask, Father, that you would guide us, direct us, motivate us, empower us by your Holy Spirit. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding. Give us direction, we pray in Jesus. Good morning. How are you all this morning?